Thank you. Well, thank you for coming. Thank you, Bridgewater Historical Society, for inviting me. Um, I'm assuming everyone at the back can hear. I could use a microphone. You can hear? So I have to tell you, when I was asked to do this talk, uh, I thought, that's a no-brainer. I can easily do that. Anyway, the problem with Shackleton, who didn't actually get to the South Pole and didn't achieve any of his goals, there's more stuff about him uh, than you could ever imagine, and I brought some of the books. So I went to the Antarctic in 2020. Unfortunately, I didn't find the photographs till about two hours ago and quickly had to install them into this PowerPoint thing, which I'd never used before. And it's a pretty all-encompassing story. Um, and he's an interesting character. What I'm going to try and do is show Shackleton in the context of what was really known as the heroic age of Antarctic exploration. And it was a different world back then, and there was barely any radio, and there's no help, and all that. You've just got to bear that in mind. Um, I noticed, uh, hopefully I can remember all my jokes to keep you cheerful, but I did notice in the original description that I was asked to make that somebody corrected and put distant cousin. So I quickly got back to Sue and said, remove that. It's extremely bad for publicity. Uh, it's not good for furniture sales. And I uh, have spent most of my life trying to prove how closely related I am. So I composed this little chart here, which I suggest you study. This profile, apparently I was sticking my neck out too far when the photograph was taken. But this chart, I think I sent it to my brother and he said, oh my god, we're very closely related. So uh, I figured it was working. Um, I, when I came to this country at the age of 23 uh, with Simon Pierce as a glass blower, nobody in my time in English or Irish schools had ever asked me was I related to Shackleton. I went to a swimming pool four days after I arrived in Quichi and the attendant came up to me and said, oh my God, are you related to Anna Shackleton? And I looked at him like, sorry? And of course, I hadn't even read the book. I'd heard my brother ranting on endlessly about it, and it's like... So my point of view on Shackleton is a little bit... Uh, is it objective or subjective? But a little bit set apart. My brother uh, has spent... His, he's been there 40 times, let's say that. And when my other brother is asked, is he related to Shackleton, he says, no, but my brother is related. <laughs> So, the, as you know, we are all related to Abraham, who's at the top up here. And he's the guy that 260 years ago emigrated from uh, England to Ireland. And he, he really started that branch of the Irish family uh, in 1720. Okay, and he came from that house on the left. And he was a school teacher at the age of 23 and he was taken on as a tutor. I hasten to add that Shackleton's are Quakers. We were not part of Oliver Cromwell's uh, beating the hell out of all the Irish. In fact, Quakers are peace lovers, and this, I'm sure he's a very nice young guy, came over, and he was such a good tutor that he started a school in 1727. <clears throat> the I have to warn you, and I'll just go back here just to give you a double warning. There will be a quiz. If anyone can tell you, I'm not telling you how I'm related to Shackleton because I don't need to because you've all figured it out on there. But if you, the first person to come up to me and tell me at the end of the lecture how I'm related to Shackleton, I'll give them a can of polar granola. <laughs> okay, so pay attention is the warning there. And there may be some other free cans too. Uh, we, Shackleton, Abraham came over his grandson was called Abraham, and Abraham started milling flour in 1776. It turns out when I moved to America, I learned a lot, not only about my relation to Ernest Shackleton, but also I always thought 1776 was when the Shackletons started milling flour in Ireland. I have been told over the years, pretty much every day, that 1776 is a completely different animal over here. But what's kind of interesting, which I didn't realize until we were restoring our end of the Bridgewater Mill, that I've spent my whole life in mills. And this was the last remaining. This is now belongs to the Irish state. That's the River Liffey, and it 
flows into Dublin and then it makes being made into Guinness. And um, but I really grew up around mills and the next mill when I immigrated to this country, there I am, sadly, uh, <laughs> blowing glass in Simon Pierce's mill in Quichi in 1981. And um, there's his mill. And then as some of you know, oopsie, wrong button, uh, now I've been making furniture uh, in the Bridgewater Mill for the last 30, 35 years, which is actually pretty remarkable. Consider highly. <laughs> Don't sit right there, I'm scared. <laughs> no, I'm joking. So uh, let's see what the next slide brings. So that's our little milling thing. So Shackleton was Abram had, I think, I can't remember what the picture said, but he had a son called Ebenezer. Ebenezer had two sons. One went down the line to Ernest Shackleton. The other was followed the line of the flour milling family. And uh, I'll give you a little tip, but Ernest Shackleton is my five greats grandfather, and he was Ernest's, I'll forget it. Uh, <laughs> this is Shackleton at the age of 16. The Shackleton, his parents uh, moved from Ireland to England at the age of 10. He would hit a farm and his health was not so great, so he thought, I'm going to become a doctor. Seems like a sensible choice if your health's not great. And he moved to England. And Shackleton, uh, he loved poetry, but he wasn't great in school. And he joined the Merchant uh, Navy. And which is a defining, there's two things about what I just said. One is that Shackleton was fundamentally Anglo-Irish, which if you've ever been to Ireland, and I grew up in Ireland, the Irish have a somewhat tainted view of the English. And that bears quite a lot on the, on the remaining part of the story. But the other thing is that Shackleton really did, despite all his faults and failures, he went to sea for like seven years, and he was uh, a merchant seaman. He knew how to rough it on board. He also had a reputation of being, um, get to, got on with people very well. He was also a leader, and he was extremely uh, positive guy. This is his family. That's him at the back. There was eight kids. There was, he had one brother called Frank, who we'll talk about later, who ended up being kind of naughty. Uh, so when Shackleton came back from being a merchant seaman, he got, I don't know how it happened, uh, but he got recruited by Captain Scott, and I'll show you some good pictures later on, but Captain Scott was classic straight out of the Royal Navy. I mean, we've got to be very careful of Shackleton's what we say about him, but he probably kind of stuck up. Uh, and there is Captain Scott, and there is Shackleton. They went off to find the South Pole they, and in the discovery. And if I look at my notes here, which I've got to scuffle along, uh, I can, some of these dates are pretty crucial. So this is with Captain Scott in 1901 to 1904, and he was 27 years old. This is a picture of Captain Scott in his cabin. And the thing about it was, they did try to get to the South Pole, and to Scott's credit, he did bring Shackleton with him. I think Shackleton was a people person, and he was probably a good person to bring along. There were three of them that tried to get to the Pole, and they didn't get very close. And I have to say, and Shackleton probably falls in this category, they were basically incompetent. They had very little experience. I mean, Shackleton was an incredible sailor, but crossing the ice, I mean, you can't blame them, they hadn't been there, but uh, crossing the ice was an extremely hazardous business, and they really didn't know how to do it. Shackleton, uh, to his fury, was um, sent home by Scott, uh, and because he said that Shackleton had some sort of physical ailment. And Shackleton was pissed. And so, uh, he got married. Is that what happened? <laughs> no, he, no, he didn't get married because he was pissed. He got married when he got back to Emily Dorman, who was a extremely long-suffering lady because Shackleton spent most of his life going to the Antarctic, and I have a few theories why he did that, which I'll tell you in a minute. Uh, Shackleton was 
I popped this in here just to, he was basically an entrepreneur. And in those days, you kind of had to prove yourself, uh, you know, and it was the age of exploration. So, but he was an entrepreneur. He also had to prove himself to his new wife, that, and particularly the father, that he could make some money. So he had, he tried to become a politician. He tried to start a cigarette company. He was a major. He went to Russia. Um, but um, anyway, he's, he'll be very proud that cigarette can sold for about $20,000 last year. Uh, so Shackleton uh, then organized his own expedition. He said, right, I'm going to go to the South Pole. So, and that was the Nimrod. And just in case anyone's taking notes, uh, that was in 1907 to 1909. That is a sled which was owned by my brother, uh, which went on that, uh, and which we had at home, uh, which went on that Nimrod expedition. So now, these are some of the incompetent ways. If you are thinking of going to the Antarctic, I wouldn't use any of these forms of transport. <laughs> and I think now we would laugh at this. But obviously, bringing a motor car and horses, uh, the only great use of horses is you could eat them uh, when you're in a bind. Um, and one of the key factors is they were told they should tr learn to ski, but they didn't. Uh, they were also told they should bring dogs, uh, which um, they, on that trip, they really didn't use them. Um, and just to put all this in perspective, uh, there's some penguins that Shackleton left behind after his shooting expedition, which we took. So this is Shackleton and two others. And apologies for me having to look at my notes, but I can't possibly remember all this. This is, uh, this is the furthest south that Shackleton got on the Nimrod expedition. And he's on the right there, and he's with, uh, for those who know the story, Adams, Frank Wilde, who was always his right-hand guy. And he turned around 87 miles from the pole. And he uh, always said, better a live donkey than a dead lion. And he came back. Um, and so that was the closest, and that was an extremely big deal uh, in, in those days, to get that close to the South Pole. A pretty big deal, and a testament to Shackleton, and you can put a little footnote in here about Scott coming up, uh, what happened to him. The, the thing that is almost un, not understandable, because when I, as I said, when I came over here at the age of 23, nobody talked about it. I mean, literally, nobody talked about Shackleton when I was growing up. There was a book written in 1958 by this guy, Alfred Lansing, which is the classic book about Shackleton. And it's an easy read, um, and I read it, um, uh, to impress my mother-in-law. But it, it, it was embarrassing, because they didn't achieve their goal. But this, this time, he got to the South Pole, and the adulate, he was knighted, surrounded Shackleton, and there were crowds of 30,000 people uh, when he came back. Um, and he was able to lecture all over America. Uh, my daughter told me he went to Brown University and lectured there and all over everywhere. And that's how he raised funds for the expedition. It was ext these expeditions, and he did four of them in total, uh, the first one being with Scott, um, were very, very, they sucked up a lot of money, basically. This is after the Nimrod came back and Shackleton was famous. Um, this is Shackleton with Peary. I think his name is Robert Peary, and I think he's an American. And it's an extreme amount of doubt as to whether he actually got to the North Pole. Uh, not to be derisive about the guy, um, but I even have the guy who did get to the Pole on foot was a guy called, does anybody know who got to the North Pole, apart from Robert Peary, who's, was a guy called Will, Steger Gossi, and he didn't get there till 1989. I suspect now it's probably melted away and you can't even get there, but um, the guy on the right is the hero of the day. And that really is the person who deserves uh, all the adulation. Does anybody know who the stern guy on the right is? It's, what's that? No. Amundsen. It is absolutely staggering to me that if you say the name Shackleton, everyone says, oh my God, the Antarctic Explorer. If you, and I've just proved it right now. Uh, if you say the word Amundsen, Roald Amundsen, he's hardly heard of. But he was the guy that got to the pole in 
19, I'm going to tell you now. Huh? There. Uh, North, uh, no, no. Roald Amundsen achieved the South Pole in December, important month, December 1912. And, and there he is with the famous ship called the Fram and his beloved dog. He was a kind of a loner, and when he headed out on the Fram, he told the world he was going north to the Arctic. And I think it was to do with sponsors or something, but he suddenly shot down to the Antarctic. Uh, and he got there. There really is no story. He got there, he used skis and dogs, he was highly efficient, he was a fantastic leader, and he did it. Um, and that's the end of that story. Uh, and so, meanwhile, back at the ranch, Captain Scott at the same time decided to go to the South Pole, and so it was a race to the pole. And uh, now I put this in just to show um, you know, there he is in his Antarctic gear, and you would have never seen Shackleton dressed up like that. But um, he was a classic, he's straight out of the Navy. He wasn't really, he was a kind of awkward person. He wasn't really a people person. And that, I think, you know, Shackleton's famous for his disasters. And I think Shackleton's escape from his disasters was thanks a lot to his personality. Not only leadership, but a, a people person. Um, so, these guys, unfortunate photograph, but these are the five guys that arrived at the pole, but they got there a month late. And there was Amundsen's flag, and what a bummer, eh? Uh, uh, even more of a bummer, because they ended up under that cairn uh, on their way back. So they all died. Uh, so that was kind of a sad story. Meanwhile, back at the ranch in London, Shackleton said, right, I'm going to go again. And so he started organizing, this is third trip, third trip, the Imperial Transantar Transantarctic um, Expedition, I guess that's called. Um, let me just scoot along here in my note, note department. So there was a key factor in Shackleton, which applies as much now as it did then, that he brought with him, he knew he would never be able to pay for the expedition if he didn't have good photographs. And I would not be standing here talking only for that guy, Frank Hurley, who was this extraordinary photographer who brought back some of the greatest photographs in Antarctic history. And there's thousands of books full of them. I know most of the images by heart. He apparently was a very tricky guy, and that is Shackleton and Hurley outside their tent. Shackleton made a point of always sharing a tent with him because he was a little bit of a SHIT stirrer. And so, uh, anyway, there is Hurley taking amazing photographs. I mean, I can't show you all the photographs, so we really would be here for four hours. Um, maybe we still will be. But anyway, that's Shackleton, and there's Hurley photographing. Y you cannot underestimate the power of those photographs. Shackleton bought the boat, and it was originally called the Polaris, as now most of the world knows, because they left the star from the Polaris, but Shackleton changed the name. It was built um, in Norway, uh, and if anyone wants to know, I can tell you all this stuff from my notes, but it was built, yeah, um, it was a steamship with auxiliary sail capacity built in 1912 at Sandyford, Norway, designed by Ole Ireland Larsen. 144 feet long and 25 feet wide, and it was built basically as a tourist ship, but the guy couldn't sell it. Uh, it wasn't very popular doing those trips. It was like the, the forefather of all these ships that go uh, to the Arctic and the Antarctic. It was very heavily built, uh, pine inside, green heart, if anyone who knows that is, uh, was used for the decking and such like, and huge, very, very substantial. Um, it did have a bit of a keel, unfortunately, and nowadays, there it is, uh, they painted it black. Uh, it's white here, but it, they painted it black mainly so it could be seen in the southern ice. Um, um, I'm showing you this now. He called it, he changed the name to Endurance, and he got it, he got it at a good price. It's a very strong ship. The, the, all vessels that go to the Antarctic nowadays have completely round bottoms. So when the ice comes in, they just pop up above the ice. 
Another sad story right there. But anyway, fortitude vincimus means that's our family's crest or whatever, and that um, uh, means by endurance we conquer, apparently. Um, this guy, this is Frank Shackleton. You remember in the previous photograph, this is the brother. I forgot to bring the book, unfortunately, but there is a book called Who Stole the Irish Crown Jewels? He, uh, the Irish Crown Jewels were, were kept in the Dublin Castle. And anyway, I think Frank uh, was somewhat close to Sir Arthur Vickers, who was in charge of looking after the Crown Jewels. Anyway, these, the Crown Jewels apparently littered all over this guy here, but um, they're not as fancy as the British Crown Jewels, I hasten to add. Uh, <laughs> Um, but they were stolen, and nobody ever has known what happened to them, except when Sir Arthur Vickers died, he wrote a note in his will and said, that bastard Frank Shackle definitely stole the crown jewels, <laughs> and what's more, I mean, pretty much said this, and what's more, he's the brother of the guy who never got anywhere in the South Pole. <laughs> so it's like, tss. Um, so anyway, that's the, you don't hear that story normally. Um, it's a special one for the Bridgewater Historic Society. Uh, and sorry about it, it was photographed, as all of these pictures are pretty much photographed out of books. I'm sorry about the seam. But a lot of people come from the Ross Sea to get to the South Pole. And, but Shackleton's next trip was coming from the Weddell Sea. And there is the South Pole. Um, and there's some more maps to follow just to help you along. There is a very romanticized picture of the endurance, which I thought was kind of pretty. Up. So here. I haven't got a stick, but I guess I can just point. This is the route. He left from South Georgia, and this is the Weddell Sea, which I just showed you. And they got around to here, and then he got stuck in the ice right there. Uh, so they didn't actually land on the Antarctic, but you know we don't talk about that. Uh, and so here they are getting stuck in the ice. And that date there, just so we can stay tuned to what's going on is, sorry about this, uh, stuck in the ice, February 1915. Um, and just keep that date in mind because they had a lot of work using the steam power, they're running out of coal, that's the whole expedition there on the right. So things weren't looking so good, uh, slightly lopsided. Um, and then it started getting crushed in the ice. Um, and now I've got to move along on my notes. So it's, it finally sank on November the 21st, 1915. So they were on the ice from February till November. At that point, and they were all alive, and the dogs were getting fewer, but they were all alive. Uh, Oh, I guess I showed you, you know, this isn't going backwards. So there we are, the set. And what is incredible is that luckily for them, that it was drifted, the whole ice goes around like this in a circle. And luckily for them, it got moved with the ice up to that point where it was crushed. And then it sank, 21st of November, 1915. Any questions? Everyone understands perfectly how I'm, how I'm related to Shackleton. <laughs> so then they had the terrible idea, uh, it's extremely uh, heavy, these boats, but Shackleton thought he would drag the boats, three of them, the lifeboats, across the ice to find water. And they were absolutely and utterly impossible uh, to, to drag. So they had to throw everything out, and Hurley was allowed to keep uh, a very, very few photographs of the expedition. Thousands were thrown out, which do not exist anymore and have not been found. They, so I'm skipping along here a little bit, but they finally put the, they managed to get the boats into open water. And to get to this place called Elephant Island, uh, I'll just go back here, because that's important. Uh, here is Elephant Island, okay? And I guess they launched, they managed to get themselves from here to here through sort of pack ice. And they launched the boats. And it took them, I think, five days, the most horrifying trip to Elephant Island. And this picture next 
sort of shows, one's a modern day picture, one is an artist's illustration. And they nearly died. It was an incredible, it was rough, they were, and there, don't forget, there was three boats and there was 28 people total. And there were, they had to have fresh water, they had food, but obviously had supplies left over from the expedition they didn't do. The trickiest thing was, they got to Elephant Island, which is a miracle in itself, but they landed, um, they landed in a terrible spot, and they had to spend a couple of days finding the right spot. So they did, I think they landed a place, they call it Point Wild, because it was so hair-raising. Anyway, they, you'll see some pictures later on when I was there, which I should have inserted here, but um, they then lived under these boats. Uh, and two in particular. And then this next picture is a picture that I actually took, which I inserted this morning, I forgot I had. And that is where they were. And they lived for, I think, four months. But within five days, Shackleton said, we gotta get out of here. And so he um, uh, chose one of the boats that James cared, they raised it up, the ship's carpenter, uh, they stole some boards from one of the other boats. They, they, between seals' blood and artist paint and stuff, they sealed it up. They put a mast down the middle. And this was an 800 mile boat journey. And this, I mean, never mind getting to here, but then they had an 800 mile boat journey to do to get across the Southern Seas, which are some of the wildest. And you can't just go straight there. Because if you do, you just get blown off to, I don't know, Australia or somewhere. Um, so here they are uh, launching the boat. Five of them went, um, and I can tell you who they were. Frank Wilde, who is Shackleton's right-hand man. Ernest uh, uh, went, um, and then uh, Crean, who was an Irish guy, McNish, and Vincent and McCarthy. So the next picture it, this, this guy, another hero, Captain Worsley, was the captain of the ship, but an incredible navigator. Again, they would not have hit South Georgia in the southern seas without Worsley and his famous sextant, which was in the American Museum of Natural History, for people to try it out. The guy on the right was Frank Wilde, who was always Shackleton's friend, went on all his expeditions, and he was left behind to make sure Shackleton was always watching out that people were looked after and happy and there was no outbreaks of dissent. Because you can only imagine that people were getting somewhat pissed off. Shackleton uh, never allowed anyone, like the food supplies were running low, Shackleton would never listen to, Ord Lees was the only naval guy he brought with him and Ord Lees was constantly chirping about, we're gonna run out of food and Shackleton just shut him down. Another guy said, well, you're not in charge of the ship anymore because it's the ship sank. And Shackleton said, by these laws or something, I am, and if you disobey, I'll shoot you. And he had to, he's not the sort of guy for shooting people, he don't think he ever shot anyone. But he had to lay down the law, absolutely, to make sure that everyone understood that this, everyone had to get out alive and they had to follow him. Uh, and there they are waving goodbye to the little boat uh, this, the funny thing about this picture is that it got doctored and Hurley was short of a picture of them coming back to save them. And so they did, they put a ship in the background and anyway, they fiddled with the thing and turned it upside down and inside out. But uh, there were like incredible, I mean, it was just, the whole thing was incredible. And they built a thing over the top. They had, they had proper, um, whatever you call that in naval terms, you know, when they no, the timing, uh, you know, watches. And it was all rigorously, uh, you know, you went down, tried to get some sleep and uh, whatever. This is a map of the trip that they did. And so you, it's pretty much self-explanatory. But there's Elephant Island, there's South Georgia in a 22-foot boat. This, luckily I've got to remember all my gear is a replica of the boat. Seems to have lost, it seems to have got a little bit beaten up for a result of the journey, but from Bridgewater. Uh, <laughs> I don't do musical instruments or boats. Anyway, I can't fix that, but anyway. That, that is a replica of the boat, which was available 
a few years ago, but I can't get it anymore. This, just while I'm here, is the flag that they, they always had a sledging flag which they pulled along behind them. And that is a copy my brother had made of the sledging flag to, uh, to identify, it's like a, a, a flag on a mast, uh, to identify whose sledge it was. Um, anything more on that? I think that pretty much tells you the story. How many miles? 800. They look closer, but much more difficult to get to, and much wilder waters. They are closer, that's a really good observation. But it was easier, because they were able to use the drift of the, so they basically headed out this direction. They would have, they would have got, they wouldn't have made it. For some reason, this is like, not the roaring 40s, somebody else will know what it is, but um, this is terrifying. And when you, when you go to the Antarctic, you go across here, and if it's calm, they call it the Drake Lake. And if it's bad, they call it the Drake Shake. Um, but so they must have known quite a bit about it. But they hid it out here and then blew themselves back to the island. Um, also, that's where they left from, and they knew there was a whaling station. But yeah, it does look a lot closer. But there are good reasons why he didn't do it. So then they landed on the wrong side of South Georgia, and they were like. Done. I mean, the one, two of them had gone completely hysterical and, hysterical and were like incomprehensible. Um, but Shackleton and two others, which I can't remember the names of them, they then, and I will say, people have tried to do this hike without, with radios and all that stuff and still not been able to do what they did. It took them three days and that was all the food they had. And they had a, um, a roll of rope. And they, they hit it out, went the wrong direction. And anyway, finally, they went all the way across to get help at Strom Nest, which is a whaling station. Um, there was one famous part of the story uh, where um, they didn't, it was in the middle of the night. They had to keep going all the time. But they didn't know, there was a huge slope downwards, and they'd like, they did not have time to hike it. So they rolled up the ro rope and gang together, and they just got on this roll of rope, and they just slid down into what could have been over a cliff. But they had, it was basically they're trying to save their lives. So they got to Strom Ness, and then uh, they went round, well, they didn't go round, yeah, they went round to collect the people on the other side of the island, but then they had the other people, 23 people, stuck on Elephant Island. So Shackleton then managed three times they tried to go to Elephant Island, these three different ships. On the fourth time, this sh boat called the Yelko uh, from Chile uh, was able to save them. Uh, and there is, there they are all are on the ship coming back into uh, some harbor somewhere. Um, and they were all saved from... How long was the 800 miles scale? Uh, oh my god, tricky question. Uh, I have it. 800 miles, 16 days, I'm sorry. Then, this is the famous furniture maker, Charles Shackleton here in the middle, in the Antarctic, just not to be outdone. Uh, so I went in 2020, as I say, I discovered all these photographs this morning at about 11 o'clock, and it's like, I can't not show these photographs. And uh, that was the Russian... Uh, thingamajig we went on. So there I am, and this was a private expedition, somebody called Andy McKelvey, and they wanted to bring on board, it was a corporate trip, he brought them to all sorts of funny places, but he wanted a relative of the people who went on the expedition to come on board. So this is Peter Wordy in the middle, and this is Vincent, um, I can't remember his first name, but there, there were like 10 of us on board this trip. And here is that Russian icebreaker going through pack ice. I just thought that was uh, an amazing photo. And I s then uh, there we are fishing someone who fell overboard uh, from in the water. No, they had a thing where they'd give you a glass of whiskey if you jumped in. They, but they put you on a rope uh, and then yanked you out. And then they had a big defibrillator uh, on the... On the <laughs> 
That, that was why I didn't do it. There's no pictures, no pictures of me. Uh, that is a beautiful penguin called a chin strap penguin. We, uh, as I said, there's thousands of photographs and even the ones I took. Uh, and here we are. One of the wonderful things was they had two helicopters on board. So we were able to uh, do, here's the helicopter uh, landing on the pack ice and here it is steaming along. This is all in 2020. And then I went again five years ago. We took like a, a bunch of our customers to the Antarctic as part of a bigger trip. And there's Miranda and myself in the Antarctic. And there were, I think there was like, I don't know how many penguins there, like 4,000 or something. So just to finish up that story of that trip, they all obviously got home uh, safe. And they got back during, they left at the beginning of the war. Churchill said, you can go. Literally the war had started the day before. They got back and the war was still going to their complete disbelief. And two people uh, who had survived went to fight in the war and were killed within a couple of months. Uh, um, but um, that was why when I was growing up, I think, like when Carol Alexander wrote the book and did the exhibition at the Museum of Natural History, she went to England to find all the relatives. And she actually brought them back to the exhibition. But they wouldn't talk. Because it was kind of embarrassing because everyone came back alive. And that, I believe, is why the story really was suppressed until this book came out. And it was really this country that, and I think you will agree, having seen these pictures, this country recognized this story. I mean, leadership, I think, in those days was not a recognized attribute. It just happened. Whereas the Americans read this story and said, this is an incredible story, not only of leadership, but also like the fact they got out alive. Anyway, Worsley wrote down very carefully where it sank. And for five years, uh, well, well, the first time was in 2019, this ship went to try and find the Endurance. And the first time, uh, it didn't work. Uh, and the cord broke to the, uh, to the drone. And so they had to, yes? Because everyone was dying all over, so it was not a good story in the press to say these guys, not only did they didn't even land on the Antarctic, but they did, none of them died. And after a war, I mean, luckily, a lot of us haven't been in a war, but you know, people dying is what it's, I think, when there's some famous quote, like, that's why Scott, at that time, was absolutely adulated, because he died, and there was nothing, there's no, oh, I know what the expression is, there's no hero like a dead hero. And Shackleton was not dead, and nobody else was. This is the thing that they sent down, built by Saab, it's a drone, uh, that they sent down and uh, to try and find the endurance. And they didn't know how deep it was, but the, the, the depth of the Weddell Sea at that point was about 10,000 feet or nearly a mile. And I followed pretty closely, as I think Jeanette might have also, you know, they sent out updates of how they were getting on. It was towards the end that they suddenly came back uh, with a photograph. And here we are in the Boston Globe. And, you know, my phone was ringing off the hook the next morning uh, saying, oh, my God, can you believe it? Uh, they found the endurance. So in perfect, because it's so deep, there's nothing lives down there apart from and there was another New York Times article all about the wildlife that is stuck onto it, the polyps, God knows what. But that is the, that is the star of the Polaris, which it was originally called. And that was one of the first sites they saw. They're, I haven't got, I mean, these are all, but all in perfect shape. I did um, call Shacklin's granddaughter about a week later, and I said, look, uh, because she was on British television, television and she announced the whole country to, and told them, don't touch my stuff. So uh, uh, it turns out it's owned by the, uh, the Antarctic Heritage Trust. But I called her up and said, would she give me a few bits for a coffee table off the deck? She's, she's a pretty icy, well, she's a pretty icy lady. Uh, uh, anyway, she finally got the joke. So I sent her a free can of polar granola. But yeah, you know... <laughs> So uh, anyway, you're not allowed to touch it, and it'll stay down there, which is the big question. Shackleton then, having not achieved that, uh, decided to do another expedition called the Quest. And that was in 1921. 
And he didn't really know where he was going. Um, but one book I read, which my brother doesn't like the book, and I think I know why, is uh, written by Michael, Michael Collins, I think. But anyway, his theory was that he was always in debt and in trouble. And in those days, if you were in debt, one good place to go is get on a ship and get the hell out. And if you're going to get the hell out, go to the Antarctic because nobody will find you. And I think there was, a, there was an element. They said when he went out to sea, he was the, he, that's when he was happy. And his wife knew that. Uh, but he did manage to have three kids. Um, and that is the quest leaving, uh, leaving London in 1921. This is... And they got as far as, I think, the whaling station in South Georgia. Um, but this is, that's Frank Wilde on his right, his buddy. And that is Shackleton. And that is the last photograph of Shackleton. Um, and that is the cabin uh, where, he, um, where he died uh, a couple of days later. And he, but he was, he was up and about. He wasn't basically that, didn't seem that sick. He just had this pain. Um, and his buddy, either Frank Wilde or Worsley, said, you know, he said, what can I do to stop this? And, and um, the guy said, well, you might need to back off on the alcohol. It's probably not very good for you. Apparently, in the, in, in the latter days, he liked to have a bottle of champagne for breakfast, uh, <laughs> which is probably why he was such an optimist all day long. Uh, but heart attack. I, they think it was a heart attack. There's, he, written as a very complex description. But they said, like Scott had said, he, he had some issue with his heart. But incredible stress he'd been through. And, you know, basically looking pretty good considering the stress he went through. And there's his funeral. And there, uh, that, I'm trying to remember when that photo, that was the trip we went on five years ago. And quite bizarrely, he was born on February the 15th, and so my brother and I and the bottle of whiskey uh, were celebrating his birth date. That was the day we landed and celebrating his birth date. Um, yeah, that's, he was buried there. They were going to ship him back, and his wife said, you know what? That guy, is, uh, he belongs in the, in the southern seas, and she was being nice about it. Um, and so they buried him. Um, and I, I love this photograph, which is when he was leaving on the quest to go, um, and we have it up in the middle, because it's like, A, so optimistic, but B, holding his hat out, I'm assuming, for money. Uh, <laughs> maybe not. Maybe he's just saying goodbye. Uh, but um, this is one of his famous quotes. Or no, he's not his. Cherry Apsley Garrard, who wrote a famous book about Scott's expedition, uh, and he said, Scott for scientific method, Amundsen for speed and efficiency, but when disaster strikes and all hope is gone, get down on your knees and pay, pray for Shackleton. Um, and that's one of, the, you know, a lot of people come up to me and say, well, you know, uh, do you feel like, you know, as you now know, I'm very closely related to Shackleton, um, you know, how does it feel to be related and what sort of similar characteristics do you have? Well, I've been adding them up over the last 35 years, and I think I'm an optimist. My mother always called me Cheerful Charlie. And, uh, and what was the other thing? I'm an entrepreneur, uh, which Shackleton definitely was, although I think I've done a tiny bit better than him. And thirdly, he was always hunting for money, which I'm always <laughs> hunting for money. <laughs> so, uh, now this is all about the granola, which is... <laughs> If anybody can tell me in the next five minutes how I'm related to Shackleton, they can have this can. But I, just by way, and it's for... What? No. No, oh, that's way too... What? No. Oh, terrible, no. no. I told you it was a close relation. For God. Has nobody got it into their heads yet? I'm his brother. <laughs> so this is the... Oof, lordy, lordy. I'm, I, I thought this was the historical society. Um, so I'm just going to read from this camp because we got a lot of people, uh, particularly broke Shackleton relations coming in, wanting me to come down from my office and explain this whole story. 
to them and, you know, sort of touch me because I was so closely related. <laughs> so finally, my nephew came over here one day and he said, Charlie, you make this beautiful granola. Why don't you call it polar granola and put the whole story on the can and then sell it to them? <laughs> so unbelievably, the whole story is on the can. <laughs> my son says it's amazing for gritting driveways, but that's being rude. In 1909, the whole story is literally on here, so it's very valuable. Despite the fifth, I'm giving you a special deal of $15 today. In 1909, Shackleton was able to get to within 97 miles of the South Pole. Now, with Polar Granola's mind-bending, vital, and secret formula, you'll be able to get there yourself. Uh, oh, by the way, see map on bottom. It comes with a free map on how to get there. Anyway, so, so we've been saved by the granola. Um, we did, uh, we did have, Sue and I, uh, I better keep the granola up there just so you don't forget. Um, we did have a recording of Shackleton's voice, which I had on my computer. Unfortunately, I downloaded and paid for it for five bucks off audible.com, and then I couldn't get it to play without signing up for about 150 other things. So then I hold my, held my phone up to the thing while it played it, put it on a voice memo, and we tried to, I don't think, I mean, I can, we can try playing it, but it's pretty amazing to hear his voice talking about the expedition. Yeah, I don't think, you can all go to audible.com and you can get it, and it's amazing. And there's actually some film coverage, which I thought I had. I think that's the end of my story. So nobody has come up with how related, so we'll just call it uncle, okay? <laughs> Okay, there's no excuses. It's very obvious, by the way. The thing, about, the thing about removed, the word removed, it's basically spot the number of generations different. Oh, oh. Ben was at the breakfast table this morning. He said, well, what is your relation? I said, I can't talk about it in public. I'm not telling you, Ben, what it is. <laughs> Who said that? Now you'll be able to go to the South Pole. You've go. you got the directions, you've got the story. South Pole Club in Ireland. Exactly, yeah, where Tom Green ended up. That's right. Yeah. Have you been there? No. Yeah. So, um, what's that? Uh, I think it was August. So it took four months to get back to them. Yeah. They were four months in Elephant Island through a terrible part of winter. I can't, did I say they landed in April? And I think they were picked up in August. Charlie, I hate to ask this, but what Oh, no, you go for dogs? it. What? What happened to the dogs? Food. Yeah. Yeah. 63 dogs went. But that was vital. And one of the things, Shackleton was one of the first people to um, understand that you needed fresh food to stop scurvy. And one of the reasons he was sent back on Scott's expedition is that all his lips were getting like torn up, and that's apparently one of the first signs of scurvy and malnutrition. They, in the Arctic, there was a whole expedition that died, and it was the lead sealing the cans of tomatoes, and the tomatoes uh, are acidic and they ate away, and they, they couldn't understand. They were all staggering across the ice trying to get back from the Arctic. Yeah, they did. At the American Museum of Natural History, they had the boat. They had the James Caird, which is in England, in the, in the school. He went to Dulwich College. And they brought that over to the American New Museum of Natural History, and they did a huge seascape and rolling, and then they set the sextant up. And so just like that, they, people yes. just were like, impossibly difficult to get a sun sighting when the ship is rolling, the boat is rolling around. I'm, mem I'm a member of the Anna Shackleton Appreciation Society, as you can probably tell. And uh, they, I noticed yesterday somebody went to a museum in Cornwall where they got a great display. And can anyone guess the average age of the 28 people on the t expedition? 
33. I thought that was pretty young, actually. You're all, 33, I think they said. No, which seemed pretty young to me. Like Hurley was 27. That seems like a kid to me. It's all the pay he promised. All the what? All the pay he promised. He, he did promise a lot of pay. Yep, that was a problem. Yeah, this, so, yes. What was the depth that they found in there? 10,000 feet. Wow. Incredible. And as I say, the first one failed when the cord snapped. Yeah, the guy who did it, who again is in my notes, which I can't get at, um, he said it was like he'd never seen a shipwreck so well preserved. And also, yeah, such a difficult one to get a hold of. 